Well, thank you all. It's a delight to, to see you all, and uh, we're honored that you would uh, join us for this, uh, what's to us, a very uh, special event. Uh, I believe it's the uh, sixth annual uh, Diane Nippers uh, lecture, uh, which honors um, Diane Nippers, uh, who uh, served IRD, I believe, for 23 years, uh, president of the IRD for uh, 12 years. She uh, hired me and uh, one of our other current staffers, Faith McDonald, and I believe two of our staffers in the former staffers in the audience, Steve Rempe and Alan Wisdom, uh, she also uh, hired. Uh, many others here uh, knew and loved uh, Diane, and she's still very much uh, in our memories, uh, both as um, a woman of a tremendous uh, Christian faith and integrity and great intelligence and uh, commitment. And this lecture series was founded uh, to uh, recall her commitment to reforming the political and social witness uh, of the church, and, and as a part of that, her deep commitment to religious liberty uh, for all people. Our uh, speaker, uh, wonderfully this evening, is someone who uh, knew Diane very well, in fact, uh, was the first president of the Institute on uh, Religion and Democracy, and uh, unbelievably, I first met him uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, when I was just out of college, and he was uh, still a very young man himself. And uh, Diane Nippers, who was then vice president of the IRD in 1987, uh, organized a lunch for the three of us. And uh, I don't think that uh, Kent Hill or I could have imagined that 29 years later, here I would be uh, introducing him as uh, my predecessor as the president of the uh, IRD. Uh, but uh, Kent... Um, became president of the IRD in um, 1986, as I recall, uh, and then uh, left uh, the IRD to uh, become president of a um, university in his uh, denomination, which was Church of the Nazarene, uh, after which uh, he served in the uh, George W. Uh, Bush administration at USAID, and would also work at the uh, Templeton Foundation. And uh, from there, I uh, became a vice president at the World Vision uh, here in Washington, and uh, from there has uh, gone on to his latest assignment at the uh, newly formed uh, uh, Religious Freedom Institute associated with the Berkeley Center at uh, Georgetown University. So in a way, Kent is returning to his roots of uh, religious liberty um, advocacy, uh, recalling back in the 1980s when uh, the IRD uh, was in uh, the forefront of challenging America's churches, many of whom were too silent about the persecution of the church and the persecution of other persons of uh, conscience behind uh, the old um, Iron Curtain. A very different era, but in many ways um, not too different from our own times when still uh, too much of American Christianity is silent or different to the persecution of uh, fellow believers and other persons of conscience um, around the world. Um, I should mention that uh, Diane Nipper's um, husband, uh, Ed Nippers, the, the former first gentleman of the IRD, is uh, here in the audience. So uh, make sure you say hello to uh, Ed, who's a distinguished looking gray-haired man uh, back in the back end. Typically, Diane's parents, uh, Vera and Clancy, Clancy LaMasters from Florida, uh, are here. This will be the first event uh, they've missed, but Clancy uh, called me. He's now a uh, robust uh, age 90 and uh, sounded terrific over the phone, but he said that uh, age is catching up with him a little bit and the idea of travel from Florida sounded a little bit complicated uh, this time, but he said uh, their good wishes and appreciation and I assured them of our uh, affection and uh, warm memories of Diane and uh, hopefully we will have a video this evening that we can transmit to uh, uh, the little masters and uh, many others who could not be here this evening. But uh, Kent, uh, we welcome you and appreciate you and I understand you're going to be sharing a few memories yourself about uh, Diane. So thank you. Mark, I'm in. I'm impressed with your memory. I didn't remember all those jobs. I. Uh, <laughs> you can either say I've had a distinguished career. Or I haven't been able to keep a job. You can uh, make your choice on that if, if you want. But I'm honored to be here. It's, it's great to see you and to see some friends from the past that I haven't seen for a while. 
Uh, but I'm particularly honored because of uh, Diane Nippers, and I want to just say a word about that. My wife Janice is here tonight, and I remember 30 years ago, in fact, it was 30 years ago this summer when we drove across country with our two kids, and as I told the board uh, this afternoon, I can thank IRD for leaving a tenured position at Seattle Pacific, going on leave of absence and never coming back. And it's partly IRD's fault, partly Diane's fault, because I inherited as my number two, uh, Diane, and, uh, and I thought this morning a little bit about how I would define Diane. And some of you knew her quite well, but for me, she had this remarkable uh, political acumen, intelligence, and most importantly, she was a person of very deep religious faith. And, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Jan and I with our kids went to the Soviet Union on leave from uh, IRD to work with the parliamentarians who were crafting some of the first religious freedom uh, laws there and I was teaching at Moscow State University. Of all things, can you imagine teaching church-state relations and G.K. Chesterton uh, to folks who 12 or 13, 14 years before had confiscated my books on religion when I was writing a a, a doctoral dissertation there. But Diane was in charge while I was away, and uh, she did a great job there. And it was I was delighted to watch her career as uh, president of IRD those 12 years. Uh, she emerged as far more important than just a person at IRD. She was respected really throughout the country by foes and friends alike because she was such a, a fine and sterling person. And we miss her a great deal. I miss her a great deal. And uh, one of the gifts of Diane to me was the gift of the friendship with Ed Nippers. And if you come to our house, you'll see our house is filled with paintings by Ed Nippers. And uh, we went to his uh, studio the other day, and sure enough, he's uh, painting as uh, beautifully as before. And uh, that is one of the things I'm also very grateful to Diane for. And I think Diane would have really enjoyed the topic uh, that I've chosen to try to address with you tonight. And as some of you know, particularly if you know me at all, I use these kinds of, an, of occasions as an excuse to learn, uh, to push the boundaries of what I know. And then I end up with far more than I could possibly give in uh, a few minutes in a lecture. And so that's exactly what we've got tonight. And I've cut about 40 or 50 percent out of what I have written. And if you want to hear the rest of the story, uh, Mark can probably figure out a way to get you the text. But the question I am posing is, uh, will Christianity survive in the Middle East? And I want to begin with this sort of stark fact. Uh, a recent um, study from the Pew Research Center in 2014 noted that about uh, three quarters of the world's 7.2 billion people live in places where religion is restricted or highly restricted. And the worst places, you won't be surprised to know, are often um, Muslim-majority settings in the Middle East and North Africa. And that has caused particular problems, of course, for Christians in that part of the world, and it's that about which I would like to talk tonight. Open Doors has reported that 322 Christians are killed every month. 214 um, churches or Christian properties are destroyed worldwide at some place in the world. 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians every month. And the great majority of the violence done against religious believers is against Christians, not surprisingly, the biggest group in the world, and Muslims. Uh, they're the ones who suffer the most. But I want to make one thing really clear here tonight before we get very much further. We think about the Middle East and we think about uh, Muslims, and we forget the fact that 80% of all the Muslims in the world are not in the Middle East. Only 20% or less are in North Africa and the Middle East. And that's going to be an important fact to keep in mind as we talk a little bit tonight. And though the relationship has been strained often between Christians and Muslims through the centuries, another central point to keep in mind, and I'll repeat it several times tonight, is that if you look back through history, the tension we see now is much worse than it has usually been. Much of the time, Christians and Muslims have been able to coexist even quite well 
And we've got to remember that because that gives us hope that perhaps that can happen again. So let's begin by talking a little bit about the plight of Christians in the Middle East. And in this uh, global digital age, when images splash across our our electronic devices, they can shock us, they can dismay us, they can move us. Think of what happened on September the 15th when the world finally began to awake to the horror of the greatest refugee crisis since World War II. 60 million refugees in the world today. And it was that little boy washed up, that little Syrian boy washed up on a Turkish shore. And all of a sudden, it became personal. And we realized, now this is really serious. And think of what happened exactly eight months to the day in early sept- in, in 2015, on February the 15th, when ISIL, or ISIS, released that chilling five-minute video of the brutal execution of 21 mainly Egyptian cops who were taken to the beach there and then beheaded. And the, you know, the videos are available to see the beheadings I've seen more than one of these videos. It's difficult to see. Now, I think there are three factors in recent decades which have been and are key to understanding uh, the conflict and the anarchy in the Middle East. The first one is the rise of radical Islamist thought. And I want to make it absolutely clear, this is mainly not a product of ISIL. ISIL is a product of that. And it goes back a century. And here talking about the rise of Wahhabism in the 18th century. You're talking about the genocidal impulses in the last stages of the Ottoman Empire. And by the way, three and a half million Assyrians, Greeks, and Armenians died. And the stories about what happened to them are every bit as bad as anything we've seen that ISIS is doing. And it was three and a half million who died early in this century. So that genocidal impulse in the last stages of the Ottoman Empire, which the uh, government of Turkey today is still finding it difficult to accept. And then, of course, in the 1920s, we have the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, a second contributing factor to the precarious state of Christians and other religious communities in the Middle East in recent years is the sectarian violence and anarchy which has uh, followed the overthrow of uh, Saddam Hussein. And then the third factor, which is so critical, it is the catastrophic civil war in Syria, which began in 2011, which has produced uh, four or 500,000 uh, casualties uh, to death to date, probably four or 4.8 or 5 million uh, registered refugees or more than that. And probably another 6.1, I've seen higher numbers of IDPs internally displaced. In fact, you've got over half the population of Syria, which is either refugee or IDP. We had people from Iraq escaping to Syria only to find themselves in Aleppo, of all places, the place today which is probably the most dangerous in the world to be. So I want to begin with just a very quick summary of this, and I'm going to have to go faster than I had even thought I was uh, going to go. I just want to note this, that of of the 30 to 35 million Middle Eastern Christians, less than half of them remain in the Middle East. Uh, The most recent Pew Research Center information we have goes back to 2010. It said 12.7 million, and that, of course, is before the outflow that has happened in Syria and Iraq and in other places in recent years. So we know that number is lower than that now. Um, This is so painful to skip things, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. I I do want to note this. Although we're talking about Iraq and Syria, if we had the time, what we ought to also talk about is Turkey and the fact that over the last century, you had a situation where there's been a substantial decline of Christians in Turkey. Now you've got less than 1% of the population of Turkey is Christian. You have a situation in the Holy Land where although there are certainly Christians there and they're not mainly in in Palestine or in the occupied territories and they're not mainly the victims of religious persecution, persecution, certainly not by the Jews, you still have, if you go back 80, 90 years, an outflow of Palestine from about 10% in 1920 
to well less than 1% today. So that's a significant decline. If you look at the tiny uh, Christian population in Iran, maybe 0.3%, and look at the statistics and what's going on there, it's not a happy story. Or take the situation of Egypt, which I'll say just a little bit about, but here's the thing to remember about Egypt. Egypt is the place with the most Christians in the Middle East. 8 to 12 percent, perhaps, of the population, mainly cops. And there's at least a government there that you can talk to, even if they don't always follow through on their pledges to be supportive. It's nothing like Iraq or Syria. Or consider Lebanon, which I will argue is one of the most critical places to pay attention to. Why? Because it's got the single highest percentage of Christians in the Middle East, in a Middle Eastern country. Actually, that's not quite true. Eritrea has a higher amount, uh, but it's not got the strategic uh, uh, importance of Lebanon. But 38% or so we think are Christian in Lebanon. Here's the problem with Lebanon. The Muslim population of about 61% has been roughly divided between the Shia and the Sunni. So can you imagine for a country of 6.4 or 4 to 6 million people throwing in 1 to 2 million Sunni refugees into that fragile demographic and religious balance? We're going to have to keep our idea, our eye on Lebanon. And the sooner we get the Syria crisis resolved and these folks can return to Syria, the better. Because if that does not happen, uh, Lebanon can be... Uh, destabilized, and that could be absolutely disastrous. And one final mention, just very quickly, Jordan. Jordan's got the one, is the one place in the Middle East where you've got a Muslim leader who actually, for a long time, has been saying the right things about wanting to keep Christians in the Middle East to advance the rich uh, cultural uh, texture of the Middle East. And so King Abdullah is somebody we can talk to and work through with but that's not to say, of course, everything is perfect in Jordan either. And at the very end of my paper, I'm just going to make a few suggestions about what I think we could do that might help in these difficult situations. So um, I wanted to mention that it's Iraq and Syria that has seen the most stunning exit of Christians. In 2003, when we invaded and we overthrew Saddam Hussein, most estimates say there may have been 1.5 million Christians there, perhaps 5 or 6% of the population. Today, we have maybe 100 to 300,000 less left, less than 1% of the population. A disastrous outflow. If things don't change there, Christianity could disappear in Iraq. Uh, that vacuum was created by the fall of Saddam. And there's a warning here for conservatives. And that is just getting rid of a bad guy doesn't necessarily mean that the result's going to be what you anticipated. I think I used to have a PhD in history, and the one thing I've learned is that there's nothing more dangerous than anarchy and conflict. And uh, if you're not really careful, you can, for the right reasons, do something good and end up with something awful. And Christians, the departure of Christians from Iraq... Uh, demonstrate that that is exactly what has happened there. Um, I won't go through all the details about Iraq except to say that I have pages and pages of examples of churches being bombed and folks being taken uh, uh, for ransom, being murdered. Uh, we know what happened when ISIL came in and they swept into Mosul, the second biggest city in August of 2014, and perhaps 30,000 Christians from there, and 125 or 150,000 Christians from the Nineveh Plain were forced to flee. The ones, some were killed, of course. Where did they flee? Mainly they went as IDPs next door to Kurdistan. They're in Erbil. Uh, we've got folks here from World Vision who do work in Erbil, uh, Catholic Relief Services. Many of our groups work in that area, but they mainly came from that area in the Nineveh Plain. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been bad there for sure. If you take a look at um, Syria, remember 2003 is when the, the problems began for Iraq. It was eight years later when the conflict in Syria erupted into civil war. And here you have a situation where there may have been 10% of a population of 25 
uh, 21 or 22 million people who are Christian. So what's been the decline because of the conflict there? Estimates range from 20 to 40 percent. Some say as high as two thirds, but we may be down to 500,000 out of a couple of million that were in Syria. And frankly, here's uh, I think uh, an almost certainty. What happened to the Christians in Iraq after the fall of Saddam could very well happen to the Christians in Syria after the fall of Assad. Uh, it's awful because Assad is a dictator and he's been brutal. Uh, the alternatives for the Christians, uh, when ISIL or others, the Sunni majority, take over, there is not likely to be good. So they are going to be in serious problem. And I, I want to add this. I, I mentioned the three and a half million who were victims of the Turkish genocide in the years around uh, 1915. Guess where a lot of those people took shelter, those Armenians? They went to Aleppo. Aleppo went from 300 families to 400,000 Armenian Christians in Aleppo. In Aleppo, which has lost 75% of its Christians through IEP status or refugee status. In so these people fled to this place that used to be safe to go. And now they find themselves in the middle of a very a difficult situation. Uh, the Christians in Syria are pawns, small enough to be pawns in a way that no matter who wins or stays in power. Uh, they are in trouble. And of course, once ISIS swept into Syria as well, that's when you got some of the worst stories of what happened. Take Raqqa, which is the center of the caliphate, according to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. When he went in there, there were 200,000 folks, about 3,000 Christians. Some Christians fled. Some were taken prison. Some were executed. And then we started to look at the stories that in the center of uh, Raqqa, were crosses. We think that the bodies may have been dead before, but they were uh, Christians were put on those crosses. Children were put on crosses. People were dismembered. Uh, I'm talking about documentation that comes from the United Nations. Um, Bishop Otto of Aleppo has confirmed that in Christian villages, young children have been beheaded and dismembered. So some of the worst abuses we could have imagined are taking places in ISIS-controlled parts of Syria. Not a very pleasant, I'm surprised you came out for a talk like this. But, it's, but, but there's more to the story than that. If you step back a few years, there's some things we've got to keep in mind. Number one, Christianity is very ancient in the Middle East. And here I'm just going to talk to you. I'm going to leave my notes aside. The second chapter of Acts, which talks about the birth of the church and the, the 3,000 who came in. Among those who are listed in the second chapter of Acts, of course, are the Parthians, the Medes, and the Elamites. Where are they from? They're from what is today Iran and Iraq. We have historical data that goes back to the historian Eusebius in the fourth century, which talks about bishops in this part of the world. You have a situation where Urbil today, where a lot of these people um, are taking refuge there was a bishop there in 100. Converted Jews were there. In fact, there were more Jews living in Mesopotamia in the first century than there was in the Holy Land. And a lot of these became Christian. And you know, up until about 600, you have more Christians in Mesopotamia in that center of the world than you do in the entire West put together. And Mesopotamia was not just a center of Christianity. It was a center of the missionary activity that went all the way to Mongolia, to China, to India. Look at the name. Look at the languages in places like India, etc., that these, these Christians speak. It's Syriac. It's languages that are so close to what Jesus spoke that you can go to the Far East or to Mesopotamia today and hear the Syrian Christians celebrating Mass in the language that's closer to what Jesus spoke than any other place on earth. It's always interesting when you just talk what you end up with. Let me just jump to this topic. Why does it matter that Christians stay in the Middle East? There are some say it's so horrendous there right now, particularly in Iraq and Syria. Why not you just arrange for the jumbo jets to go in and take the remaining ones out? After all, you would expect that that would make some sense. At least it would be humane to do that sort of thing. But the problem is that if you take from the rich culture of the Middle East, 
the presence of Jews and Christians and Yazidis and other minorities. You destroy the possibility of that rich texture that did exist there remaining there. And any time you end up, as in Turkey today, with one group of people, one religion, etc., it doesn't just spell a problem for the people that live there. It spells a problem from everybody else. Nothing is more dangerous than a culture of society that cannot tolerate within its own borders its own people. They will not tolerate their neighbors as well. And uh, many of the religious leaders in the Middle East are absolutely courageous in wanting and trying to stay, including the Bishop uh, Otto of Aleppo, who just surprises me continually in the kind of things he says about the importance of their remaining. I'll just add one thing that's sort of more of an IRD. I can't resist saying this, but I have a section in the paper which talks about, of all things, James Madison and the Article 18 of the UN Declaration. Why? And the reason is this. Madison said that the thing about a human being is that you have to understand, that a human being is wired to seek transcendent truth. He has the right to do that search. And he has an obligation to his creator to do that search. That was in his famous 1785 remonstrance against an act in Virginia, which would have required all the citizens to pay uh, some taxes to support the church. If you leave the U.S. context and go to Article 18 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and you get one of the most magnificent statements defending religious freedom, you have something that the world supported, which basically said that the, that the prosperity and the health of the world depends on that kind of diversity and that kind of tolerance, that right to seek God and the responsibility to allow others to seek God as well. If you rip that out of the Middle East or anywhere else, it won't just be a problem for the Middle East. It will be a problem for the world. And we already know that is the case. I want to shift gears here and share something with you that uh, is rather relatively new for me. I went to Israel uh, for the sixth time um, about two weeks ago. And when I was in Israel, I picked up a book I have intended to read for a very long time. It was written by William Dalrymple based on his sort of journey through the Middle East, Turkey, Lebanon. He left the, you know, Egypt, Syria. But he was following in the footsteps of a monk who in 578 left a monastery near Bethlehem. His name, the monk, was John Moskos. And he had his transcript of doing the same thing 1,400 years before. And here's what struck me uh, very, very powerfully. John Moskos, at the end of the 6th century, describes a Middle East in which there was a big question of whether the Middle East was even going to survive as a place where Christians could live. He said exactly the same thing, addressing the same topic that we're addressing here tonight. But if you go back just a little bit, remember that who could have predicted that Christians would have survived the persecution to become ascendant in the Roman Empire? And no sooner, sooner had they become ascendant than what happened? The Germans show up, the barbarians show up, and Augustine, in writing The City of God, while he's writing this, you've got the possibility that Rome's going to fall, and Rome did fall, and Christians ever since have had to ask the question, where were you, God, then? Where was the providence that brought us into ascendance, and now you've allowed us to be taken over by the, the pagan, barbarian, Germanic tribes? And, of course, we know the rest of the story. The tribes were converted, and... Uh, Christianity survived through the so-called Dark Ages and the witness of the, the monasteries, etc. Then you have John Moskos going off on his trip, finding Christians once again under siege, this time by the Persians. The Persians attacked Jerusalem and all Bethlehem and all of this long before, a few decades before Islam even rose and took the whole thing over. This is an old story, folks. It's been going on for a long time. And what Dalrymple reports in the mid-1990s was that there's been, a, there's been this constant ebb and flow and danger for the Christian community in uh, the Middle East from the very beginning. 
and particularly the last 200 years, and particularly the last 100 years, the threat has been particularly stark uh, for uh, Christians. So I, I bring that up as an historical aside just to simply say the questions we are asking now, Christians throughout the ages have needed to face. And, uh, and there are some lessons we can learn from that, both from a spiritual standpoint and also from a uh, political standpoint. I would like to switch gears here and offer some very quick ideas of what in the midst of all this we can do. Um, for Christians and non-Christians alike, we need to understand that keeping a multi-faith, multi-ethnic, diverse Middle East is in the best interest of the region, but of all of us. Uh, there was mention, uh, I think there was mention, at least at the board today, of the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown that Tom Farr, a member of the board, is president of. Tim, uh, Tim Shea Cha is here. Where are you, Tim? Tim is the deputy over there at Georgetown. And they've had a magnificent six or seven years documenting beyond any doubt at all that whenever religious freedom exists in a society, every possible measure of success for a society goes up. Economic, lack of civil um, distress, every, every indication you could possibly want, that's what the research indicates. The new organization of which I'm a part and Tim's a part, Tom is a part, the Religious Freedom Institute, is going beyond the research and saying, we've got to find a way to persuade people that that fact about what religious freedom produces is in fact uh, not known enough and that we've got to make it known and we've got to find ways to advance religious freedom. But here's our problem. If you saw just two or three weeks ago, the head of the US uh, Civil Rights Commission, a fellow by the name of Castro, of all things, said, that religious freedom now is simply a front for bigotry and hatred and awfulness. The top civil rights person in the United States said, if you hang on to traditional Christian sexual understandings of reality and you try to hide behind religious freedom, that is simply, an, that is simply a cop-out. What you're really doing is you're defending your right to be a bigot and be discriminatory. So there is not certainty anymore that religious freedom is the good that you and I assume that it is. And if we're going to have success in the Middle East, we're going to have to make the same case there that increasingly needs to be made here as well. So here are some very quick suggestions of things that we could do to help. I would suggest to you that the first thing we've got to do is we, we must not succumb uh, to the understandable temptation to throw up our hands in despair and give up. And let me tell you how the narrative goes. We've messed up before in intervening. We'll get unintended consequences. Therefore, we should do nothing. Now, what we should have learned from unintended consequences is not that you don't act, but you act very intelligently, very carefully, that you think it through. What's really going on here is an escape from responsibility. And we have got to resist that escape from responsibility. We have got to resist the temptation to believe that there is no hope in the Middle East or in other difficult places in the world. Second, I've got to say this, and we've got a, some just war theorist experts here, but this is one of those times where um, Christian just war theory does justify, after all, using force as appropriate in the proper way to deal with some of the threats that we face. It won't be enough, it won't solve the problem completely, but it's something that has to occur. We're gonna have to win hearts and minds as well, but we're not gonna get away without using some force. Third, individually and as a nation, we have got to do what we can to help refugees and IDPs. Uh, just a whole lot more we can and should do. Number four, we should support the bipartisan resolutions like H.R. 5961, which is called the Iraq, Iraq and Syria Genocide Relief and Accountability Act. I actually had the folks from uh, IRD produce the, uh, the one or two page summary of this. And uh, you know, the IDC folks uh, the in defense of Christians conference recently talked about this. But anybody who would like to see what this is about can read about it here. But our members of Congress who uh, are trying to do their best to help 
we've got to support them so that resolutions like this uh, can pass. Fifth, it is imperative that the U.S. work with Iraq to create the necessary political and societal conditions which will allow Christians and other religious communities to survive there. And here I wish I could tell you there's a quick fix. You can have a military campaign. You might even be able to retake Mosul. But to create the kind of culture in Iraq and Syria and Middle East and other places in the world where there's really safety for pluralism and religious freedom, that is a multi-decade process. And we have to be willing to look at what it's going to take, commit ourselves to it, and engage in that. And uh, we don't always do the hard work necessary to do that sort of thing. In, I would say, six, in pursuit of making more likely the survival of Christianity in the Middle East, it's imperative that we end that crisis in Syria. We've got to find a way to get that done because if we don't, it's going to destabilize uh, Lebanon and other parts of the region. And then I would argue this. We should not be so focused on Iraq and Syria that we do not pay attention to the other parts of the Middle East, like Lebanon with 38% Christian like Egypt with 10 or 12% Christians, uh, like Jordan where there's a Muslim leader who is supportive. We need to do what we can to support Christianity there so that models of living together uh, can be uh, much more fully uh, realized and successful. There's a, a House Resolution 852 which calls on Congress to provide much more foreign assistance to Lebanon. And I think that's the kind of thing we've simply got to do. We've got to avoid the mistakes of the past, but the mistakes of the past are not predictors of what necessarily will happen in the future. And let me end with just a couple of final topics. The first topic is this. There are those who say it's hopeless working with Muslims in order to somehow get this extremist form of Islam marginalized and defeated. There is on the internet right now a remarkable document. It's an open letter to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and it is signed at this point by 126 global leaders. These aren't just 126 Western Muslims. Most of these folks who signed this are from Egypt and from Yemen and are from Iraq and are from Syria. Most of them are from the Middle East, where 20% of the Muslims are. And this is a carefully crafted theological treatise, 16 pages long, which absolutely reject the central tenets of the Islamic State. Let me give you an example of the kind of things that are categorically said by these Muslim leaders to the head of ISIS. It is forbidden to kill the innocents. It is forbidden in Islam to kill emissaries, ambassadors, diplomats, journalists, and air, air aid workers. It is forbidden in Islam to harm or mistreat in any way Christians. And they even go on to say it's not appropriate to do this to Yazidis either. It is forbidden in Islam to force people to convert. It is forbidden in Islam to deny women their rights. It is forbidden in Islam to torture people. It is forbidden in Islam to disfigure the dead. It is forbidden in Islam to attribute evil acts to God. This is the statement that is being signed by the top Muslim leaders around the world. Now, it's going to take more than just a treatise like this. And some of the people on this list are on the hit list now of ISIS, as you can imagine. In fact, friends of ours, friends that work with Tim Shah. Uh, and have come to Georgetown and who speak, who are wonderful, winsome people. We have got to cooperate with these folks so that they can find within their own tradition the means to exorcise from Islam these violent and interpretive understandings that are so dangerous to the whole world and to Islam itself. And if you'd permit me, I'd like to just make some final thoughts as a Christian, leaving aside for a minute the geopolitical uh, context. And I would argue that we've, um, we've sort of, and I'm trying to look how badly I've done on my time, uh, but this is important because we are mainly Christians, not all in this audience, but we as Christians have to look at things through a Christian lens as well. 
and we've engaged tonight in a frustratingly brief and incomplete journey uh, through the history of Christianity in the Middle East. And uh, it's very easy to draw the wrong conclusions from what, what you hear. The positive future depends on the conviction that good of all majorities and small religious communities alike are advanced when religious freedom exists. And the point of this recital of history, some of it ancient, some of it all too recent, has been threefold. Number one, Christianity has always been in danger in the Middle East and elsewhere for that matter. It exists within the ebb and flow of history. We should never forget that. Second, it has served as a reminder that the sort of hostility which exists between a particularly fundamentalist and violent understanding of Islam and Christianity which plagues us today is not inevitable. It's not even typical of the relationship that has often existed between Muslims and Christians. But there's a third point to this look back at history, this look at the past and this look at the present, something that serious Christians dare not forget. You know, the church always had, has, and always will survive. And it always will be victorious over persecution. But being victorious does not always mean escaping death and suffering in the short term. Did you hear me? It does not mean always escaping death and suffering in the short term. For believing Christians, death is never the end, which the world thinks it is. Which is why the symbol of the cross or the crucifix is so powerful, though we are all tempted to forget the meaning of the cross. We're astounded at the senseless cruelty and inhumanity which we confront, that image of the 21 who died on that shore in Libya. But I find even more astounding what happened the week after. The week after, there were two of those boys, two of those brothers who were killed that day, uh, Bishoy Kamel and Samuel Kamel, had a third brother. And what he did after he saw his brothers executed, he did an interview broadcast throughout the Middle East the following week in which he not only forgave his executioners, his brother's executioners, but he thanked the Islamic State for allowing his brother's final profession of faith to be broadcast, which evidently it was. Within hours, 100,000 people on Facebook had watched that story of forgiveness. And in the New Testament, and in the Chronicles of Christian history, there is this consistent theme that if we are faithful in the face, even of persecution, that God does something with that that is unbelievable, and that it can sometimes happen even with joy, with the sense that this really is Friday, and we really do believe a Sunday is coming. And so you have a situation where Saul of Tarsus who had gone to Damascus to persecute Christians, himself becomes a Christian, himself becomes a martyr for the faith. If these things can happen for the people who are considered the leaders of the faith, they can happen again. For Christians, there are profound, there are profound and spiritual implications to what we learn about the nature of persecution from history in our own day, how it impacts our faith. Um, our own faith, McDonald here, in your journal of Providence, wrote a remarkable, remarkably fine uh, review of a book that I strongly recommend by Mindy Belts called They Say We Are Infidels on the Run from ISIS with Persecuted Christians in the Middle East. And I'll tell you what impressed me most about that book. It was the hope that the book ends with by telling the stories of those in Mosul and elsewhere who are being faithful in the midst of all of this. There's even the story of an American evangelical who went to Kurdistan, was greatly beloved by his uh, students, and ended up after several years being shot down. The father of that evangelical American young person went to Kurdistan, met with the father of the killer, forgave the father, and his father asked for forgiveness for what his son had done. The witness to all of those people in Kurdistan of what Christian faith at its best is, uh, we have not seen the end of what that tale of faithfulness will bring. 
One of the martyrs in the 2000, in 2007 in Mosul, a father, Ragid Ghani, very well aware of what he was uh, facing, said before his own death, we empathize with Christ, who entered Jerusalem in full knowledge that the consequences of his love for mankind was the cross. Thus, while bullets smashed our church windows, we offered our suffering as sign of love for Christ. This is war, real war, but we hope to carry our cross to the very end with the help of divine grace. Within hours, he was, in fact, martyred. Or the Syriac Archbishop of Mosul, one of the last to leave Mosul uh, before it was overrun in uh, 2014. They take everything from us, but they cannot take the God from our hearts. They cannot. And then there was the head monk of uh, Marmati, a 4th century monastery, 12 kilometers or so from Mosul, who said, as long as there are Christians in Iraq, a shepherd cannot leave his sheep. And so we're obliged to do all that we can to help. We have no excuse for saying it's got to be this way. Uh, and besides that, the church grows when there's persecution. You don't fold up shots like, shops like IRD or the Religious Freedom Institute or the Religious Freedom Project because the church grows, with, as Tertullian said, because of the blood of martyrs. You remember the words of Proverbs 24 where we're instructed to rescue those who are being taken away to death, hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. This was a, a citation I often used in my speeches at IRD uh, 25 or 30 years ago. William Dalrymple concluded his often sober journey through the Middle East 20 years ago with this ominous sentence. Darkness was drawing in, and behind me at the top of the hill, a chill wind was howling through the tombs. And surely there have been times when we have all been tempted to despair, and yet history and our faith teach us that despair and hopelessness are not Christian virtues. Dry bones do live again. The cross is a reminder that what seems to be the end may well be a necessary path to the resurrection. And in the end, we're called to be faithful, not to win in the short term. I believe Christianity will survive. And God willing, Christianity will one day thrive again in the Middle East. Uh, thank you. I think it's time for at least two or three questions, perhaps. Is that right? Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your informative talk and your insight. My name is Margarita. I am a Lebanese Maronite. Um, I'm a third year student at Catholic. And obviously, as a Lebanese American, I'm very concerned about what's going on in Lebanon. Um, I would like to ask you what you anticipate will happen if the Syrians are able to go back to Syria if you think that they actually will because they've been stabilizing themselves in Lebanon. Um, the Lebanese government has provided a lot of funding for the Syrian children to go to school. So mm -hmm. I almost feel like they wouldn't want to leave yeah. and go back. Yeah, I, I suppose it'll partly depend on what the situation is in Syria, right? Um, there's a lot of talk that when Mosul is taken. Uh, many of the Christians in Kurdistan have made it very clear that they're not likely to want to rush back either because they, it was their Sunni neighbors in some cases that turned them in and uh, made possible the violence done against them. So for both the Christians in Erbil who would consider going back to Mosul or Syrian refugees in Lebanon who would consider going back to Syria, it's going to depend on what kind of world they're going back to. But here's the problem with Lebanon, and you know this well, and Christina, you, at, at IDC, at the conference, that panel on Lebanon was really, I was struck by the fact, it was a panel just on what's ahead for Lebanon. And the consensus of all the folks there was that it's just not feasible to absorb one or two million Sunnis in Lebanon. Uh, I mean, Lebanon has the highest percentage of refugees in the world, let alone the question of the 
uh, religious imbalance being created by that many coming in. But here's the problem. Before the war in 2011, before the Civil War, the infrastructure strains in Lebanon were huge. There were tremendous problems. They don't have a prime minister right now. They're having a, trouble, a difficult time dealing with the south of Lebanon and Hezbollah there, which is, of course, su supported by Iran. Their situation was not was not good before the conflict. That's why we have got to focus on bringing stability around Lebanon and in the meantime, providing more assistance to Lebanon to at least take care of some of the infrastructure needs. My assumption would be if things can stabilize in Syria and something can come into existence there that is stable, most people like to go home. Syrians liked Syria. I mean, they did like Syria. They were proud of Syria. They thought there were many things about it that was the best in the Middle East. And, and a lot of the folks who took refuge in uh, Lebanon were sometimes even middle class folks. Who So if things could improve there, uh, I hope they would go back. But I, I took away from this panel a, a few weeks ago that this hope that we can just absorb them in Lebanon is probably is not well founded. I would be very worried about that. I think we're much better off to try to find a solution where they get to go home. Yeah. Yes, sir. I want to say, I'm an Orthodox priest. I know the situation there. I know a lot of people have come there to This is one of the most sober and correct assessments I've ever heard from a conservative. I'm assuming you're a conservative. And I'm really glad to hear it uh, because you don't hear it in, in the common discourse. I really want to affirm your point that if you take out Assad, you are going to create such a vacuum there that the suffering that we see now is just going to grow exponentially. There's no question about it. He is a, he's a dictator, but he's only a dictator to his political enemies. And you know, and, and the thing about Hussein, Hussein was was functionally the same way. The Christians were free to worship. If people don't threaten the government, you're essentially free there. You really are. Um, I hear I, I want to drive this point home because I hear I hear all over the place in liberal circles and conservative circles alike, Assad has to go. It would be a catastrophic mistake if we did to Syria what we did to Iraq. It would. Secondly, your point about the cultural diversity, the exodus of Christians from the Middle East is going to affect the cultures there catastrophically. And the reason is, is that it's, it's the Christians that held the positions and the cultural institutions in business. Those countries ran because of the Christians. It's, if, if, if the Christians are removed from that area, or if they flee, I tell you that the, the, the societies simply won't flourish to the extent that they, that they have. And in periods of peace, they actually flourish quite well. They're good places to live, you know, despite the non-democratic systems that, that um, we, especially in America, are so fond of criticizing. Thirdly, there has to be also a, a, an introspection on the American side. Okay, because how could we make such catastrophic mistakes? We have to ask that. You know, we wouldn't have made these mistakes, and I'm talking about the Arab Spring in particular, we wouldn't have made these mistakes had we been listening to the Christians of the region. They were warning us, don't do this. And they were telling us what would happen if we did. We did not listen. And, and... I mean, this is, this is, I'm going to make a charge here, but this is a grave moral failing. It indicates a grave moral failing on our part because we do carry some of the responsibility for the suffering that's occurring there now. Our secularism is so deep that we can't make distinctions anymore when it comes to matters of religion. I think... You know, I look at the present administration, but I'll tell you, I also see this in the conservative, in some of the, the, the conservative areas, where, where 
you know, there's just kind of an a priori negation of religion. And you pointed out what's coming down the pike where religion is going to just seem, be seen as a wellspring of bigotry. All right, that's, that's what you warned us of. Um, but if we, if we don't understand religion, if we automatically exclude it from civilized debate, that's when decisions like this end up getting made. Right, so yeah. so I think also I'll close with this. I think also we, you know, the moral culpability. I guess it's a charge, but we do carry a certain moral culpability in in the problems that that exist over there now. And we also, as Americans, we have to do some soul searching why it is we contributed to the chaos that exists there now. It's you know you, you raise some very difficult issues. I think the question of Assad is particularly difficult. Uh, because uh, even if he was a brutal dictator for 2011, the way the war has been conducted with the, the barrel bombs and, and the, the means which he has used, and I understand he was fighting against major enemies, but this is one of the most difficult situations I think we can possibly imagine, and the Syrian Christians are stuck in the middle here. They were marginally better off after 1970 uh, when Assad's father came to power. And the other minorities were as well because that was the coalition that Assad and his son uh, cobbled together. But the problems with the dictatorship, it can, create, it can create tensions that can explode. And now we've got a situation where there don't seem to be any great alternatives. And when the chaos, you're right, the chaos and the anarchy, if it, if it goes the direction of just feeding sectarianism, like after the fall of Saddam Hussein, then we've got a real problem. The world has got to figure out a way to help whatever is in the future for Syria to be a place where uh, there, is, there is the possibility of majorities and minorities living together. And I, it's hard to see exactly how that's going to happen at this point. There are Christians in Syria, as you know, who oppose Assad. There are Christians who were um, attacked by Assad if they were not considered loyal. Uh, so, um, but most, like you say, probably felt safer. But they don't like feeling safer with somebody that they also know is bad. So it's very difficult. It's a, these are, uh, that's why I say that part of our attention must be to the surrounding areas and not just focusing on the places that seem to be the most difficult. Work on Egypt and Lebanon and uh, these other places, Jordan, and, and sort of have, you know, bad things spread, good things can spread. If you can have pilots of multi-religious pluralism working between Muslims, Christians, Jews, Jews, think of the tragedy for Iraq of the exodus of the Jews. Do you know when, when Iraq was founded in 1932, did you know that Hebrew was one of the national languages of Iraq? That was because there was over 100,000 Jews in Iraq that were central, like the Christians were. Where did those Jews go in the late 40s and 1950 and 51? They went to Israel. Thank God that Israel existed to absorb them. Um, but now there's virtually no Jews in Iraq. That was not good for Iraq to lose the Jews. It would not be good for them to lose other minorities like Christians. So um, uh, we have to start where there's a, a, an opportunity to improve the situation, and then, and then, and then hopefully we can uh, take on some of these other hot spots. But what we have to avoid is the despair about, I don't know what we're going to do about Syria. I don't, I don't know what we're going to do about Syria. Uh, but we do what we can with the IDPs and the refugees. We, uh, we do what we can with the surrounding area. And uh, people are hungry for peace. I, I honestly believe, uh, and we're going to have to do this with our Muslim brothers and sisters. Uh, we cannot solve problems without their cooperation and support. And that's why this open letter gives me encouragement uh, for major professors and leaders from Al Azur uh, uh, in Egypt and the university there and others, that they signed this letter. The head muftis of many, many countries signed this letter. These are the elite saying this is totally wrong. Now, do they have the 
commitment and the strategy that will take that message to the young people. Look at the percentage of Muslim who are under 15, Islamic young people who are under 15. Uh, it's the same thing for the Christian world. We have to catechize. I heard a member of the board say today, we have to catechize our own people about what we believe. So the next step is to work with our Muslim and our Christian friends to catechize as to why is it inappropriate to do this and what are the real sources of our faith and our religion. And, uh, and we've got to win the hearts and minds of the young. And unemployed young are a very dangerous thing. So it's going to require economic empowerment in places like Kurdistan and Syria and Lebanon. doesn't sound very sexy to talk about economic development. <coughs> but by George, we better come up with economic development that can absorb people or you just have a, a willing and ready pool for any radical that comes along. Thanks. for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Now, Diane would be pleased, and certainly we're all pleased, although uh, the news you bring us is very sober, but needs to be uh, heard. I uh, omitted in my review of uh, Ken's distinguished career that he was a leader in uh, evangelicals and Catholics together, organized by uh, Richard Newhouse, who was also an IRD co-founder, and uh, Charles Colson. And in fact, Kent himself uh, went from being uh, an evangelical to a Catholic in uh, recent years. And I've noticed whenever we have a Catholic speaker for our Diane Nippers lecture, our bar bill always goes up. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I invite all of you to join us for our reception uh, afterwards and enjoy yourselves uh, robustly. Thank you.